excited. I'm, uh, I was thinking back that, um, well, it wasn't the last, last time we, we, I saw you was um, at kind of before this whole shutdown at the, at the uh, La Pole, which is, yeah, which is kind yeah. of surreal to think about. Um, but, but last year, about this time, was when we were in the Loire Valley for a couple of days. And uh, I, was, I was thinking typically in early, early July, around the 4th, I'm, I'm there either with a group or, you know, by myself or, or with last year was with you for a couple of days. And I, it was amazing to spend those days and wa- watch the way you look at the vineyards and kind of the, 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 the geography, the, the, it's just, you have a totally different kind of perspective and it makes, you know, I walk vineyards all the time and I love doing that. It's something that, I think it's fundamental to, to what we do in the business, but kind of after I saw you and the way that you, what you were looking for, the type of things that interest you and caught your eye, it completely changed the way I did it. Um, obviously, you know, it was funny. I was talking to um, Xavier Weisskopf on, on, um, on uh, Wednesday evening and he was talking about the Perouche that he has in Bordery, which we're going to taste later on. And he's like, yeah, if you break that open, then you see that brown, you know, Celex in there. And this is, this is, you know, you, you taught me to find the shiny things and then not so shiny things and which were important and which weren't, frankly. So yeah, yeah. Um, it was, it was fun. Did you, do I remember you saying you picked up your own hammer? Um, oh, I've oh, got multiple sure. hammers, but I, 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 I definitely got the habit of breaking rocks and it, it's a, okay. you know, my, my, my grandfather, actually, I, I hadn't thought about this in a long time. He used to, he used to, uh, polish rocks. He was a big oh, yeah. kind of rock. Yeah. So it was, it was funny. Um, so let's, let's dive in a little bit. I kind of, uh, I, I've been having so much fun the last week with these growers tasting through and, you know, over the week I've had all these things in my fridge going back and forth. And the one, the one other thing that really kind of amazed me about, about the way you looked at things is also your tasting. You taste and you like to think about tying that to exactly where we were in the vineyards. And you like to also, I want to say, Grill may may not be the word, but you like to get the growers thinking about what language they use and where it comes from. And I think that's an amazing um, kind of different way of looking at things. And it challenges the preconceptions and the way that we just, you know, we always assume something and you actually are trying to tie it to something real. And so hopefully you can you can pull some threads together tonight that will help us see why what we're tasting from what, you know, are, are really some amazingly talented producers. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We've got a few yep. surprises with the samples that we got. You've got a couple different things, uh, at least one different set than I do, but uh, in general, we're going to be tasting the same wine. So that's going to be fun. Um, can you maybe walk us through a little bit the, the basic, Loire geology and and maybe just France to get us situated as to where we are in Sauvignier, Mont Louis, Vouvray primarily. Yeah, absolutely. I'll um, I'll. That's one of my favorite things to do. I'll try to keep it try to keep it concise, but feel free to uh, feel free to to shorten me down if if I get a little too into the nerdy details. But um, so I'm sure people I, are gonna I, love it. So. I love talking about things in the context of their geologic history and kind of placing them, placing the wines and placing the people and placing, um, you know, even the way that the wines are made within what, what the geology kind of gives people to work with from the very beginning. So I think of it as kind of this, this story that got, you know, began to be set up hundreds of millions of years ago. And, uh, you know, now there are all of these, even day-to-day decisions, I think, that winemakers make that really are tied to that geologic history. So in France, we have to start back, you know, 400 plus million years ago. 
Um, and so this is where all of the really, really old rocks in France were first formed. And so we're talking about the Massif Central and the Massif Amorican. And so in the context of the Loire, of course, we're talking about the Massif Amorican. And so I'll show you a little drawing that I have um, here. So these red bits are the massifs. So that's where those really, really old rocks are found. And then the other thing we're going to talk about here is the Paris Basin, which is here. And so these rocks in the Paris Basin at their oldest are around 170 million years old. Whereas the Massif Central gets, I mean, most of them are around 350 million years, if not much, much older. And so those really old rocks were first formed, were first formed when uh, Pangaea kind of collided together. So before Pangaea was Pangaea, it was the plates were all separate. They crashed into each other and they created these huge mountain ranges all over the world. And so the Massif Central and the Massif Amorican all go back to this event. And that's also tied to massifs all over the world, uh, the same as like the Appalachian Mountains. And then what happened is they kind of split apart and that continent flooded and it started filling up with seawater. And it was kind of warm, tropical seawater, the exact kind of place that coral reefs and um, uh, you know, beachy conditions tend to form. And so that happened all over the world as well, not quite all over, but in a huge portion of the world. And that's where the Paris Basin formed. And so what's kind of important to realize, especially in the context of the Loire, is that I talk about this pretty often, but I often talk about it in the sense where like, you have these massifs over here, and then way out kind of where all of this water was flooded out into the ocean, you have all this other stuff going on where you have all this limestone. But in the Loire, and especially, you know, where we're talking about, we're really talking about the boundary where those two things actually come into contact with each other. And that's very different from really any other wine regions in France, where maybe if they're in contact, it's because they've been faulted against each other. But these mm -hmm. actually were deposited against each other. And that means that like the Tifo limestone that we're going to talk a lot about is actually linked to the geology of the Massif Amorican, if that makes sense. So you can actually find little bits of kind of sparkly micaceous minerals. So that's these things. This is a little piece of schist that's really sparkly and pretty. And you can actually find that forms in old metamorphic rocks. And you can find pieces of that sparkly micaceous material in this soft tufo limestone, wow. which is very different from, say, burgundy, where they really were separate. Those two things were happening very separately from each other. And if they do come into contact, even in Alsace, where they come into contact, it's because they were, you know, 20 million years ago, they were faulted and juxtaposed against each other, whereas these are kind of linked. Cool. Okay, well, that was probably did, more than I was supposed to say. No, that's, that's, that's great. And I'm sure we're gonna have a million questions about it. Do you wanna, let's, why don't we start um, where we started kind of um, in our couple of days, why don't we start out towards Savinier? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you can, you can, you can tie the bigger dis discussion into where we are in Savignier, which is which is you know an historic Shenan Shenan village and mm -hmm. Shenan Appalachian to begin with. Yeah. Okay. So, kind of diving in to the details here, I'll point you out on the map again. Um, I think it helps. But so looking here, we're going into the Loire, and like I said, here we have the Paris Basin, which is all of that limestone. That usually like in Champagne, it's very isolated. In Burgundy, we've kind of got all this mess because the Alps are right here and everything got broken up. Whereas this is still this continuous boundary between the Massif Amorican and the Paris Basin. And you can kind of imagine that relationship of what's happening. So if we look here, this red again is gonna be all of, this is the Loire, kind of does this big loop here comes out here, so then Muscadet would be in here. This is Angers, 
So Anjou is about here. And Savonier, tell me if I'm correct, because I it's not it's not quite here, but it should be right about here. Whoops. Here. Is that correct? Yeah, the the opposite side of the of the river. So you're looking. Yeah. yeah. It's tough for me to it's tough for me to see on the phone, but uh but but tell yeah, me, okay. so you're so yeah. on so so and there's a great, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a great juxtaposition that that kind of transition we started in Anjou and kind of the, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 and then to go to Savignier um, and, Poiss and Poissonier, you've got, you know, a very big transition. Unfortunately, we're not going to be tasting Anjou tonight, um, but there is that, that is kind of a, 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 a transition as far as, you know, significant geologic transition yeah exactly and then so kind of as the last point so what's happening is this was basically a big crazy mountain range and then the paris basin sort of flooded it and so this is all water it's weirdly hard to draw while doing this um <laughs> but you can imagine these big snow-capped mountains up here. And here's this kind of shallow continental sea that starts depositing limestone here. And it keeps building up over time. And what happens is right along this boundary of the Loire is while all of this limestone is kind of building up because they're all coral reefs, these mountains are also eroding down here kind of mixing in with all of this stuff. And so what you have now, and this happened for, you know, a hundred million years, not even kidding. And all of these kind of rough, rocky, rugged mountains got eroded down to what you see now, even in, you know, Anger, these really kind of soft, gentle mountains. And this is all of that old stuff that continues all the way below that limestone. And then you have these relatively flat lying layers of limestone juxtaposed right against it. Limestone, we call this, we say the crystalline basement rock because you can think of it as kind of like the basement of the continent is all this stuff that kind of continues below it. And then there are these shallow limestone layers here. And throughout time, as things erode, maybe this, maybe some of these top layers form their own little hills, and you get slightly different stuff going on along these gentle things. And the topography is not crazy different because for 150 million years, it's been eroding and smoothing off all of these crazy edges. So to pull us back to to Savignier to uh, we're mm -hmm. going to start with the the Vin Cendre mm -hmm. from uh, Thibaut Bouignon. So can you talk a little bit about you know the, that 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 vineyard there, the terroir, the soil, and then we'll kind of taste that versus the the Poissonier, yeah. um, which is which is pretty interesting to to taste these side by side. Yeah, absolutely. So. The, I'll start with the Sauvignon as well. So the, or I'm sorry, with the Vigne Sandre. Um, so this vineyard, he describes as having kind of, uh, and I like the soil is kind of ashy. And the important part about all of Sauvignon, all of really anything kind of west of Angers is that the rocks, the vineyards are made up of decomposing schist maybe a little bit of nice kind of different types of schist. But so we're looking at acidic soils that tend to produce less acidic wines in comparison to everything east of Angers, almost everything east of Angers, where we have limestone soils that have that are more basic and tend to produce wines that are higher in higher in acidity. Um, and that's kind of a complicated relationship that I wish I had kind of a, a very clear explanation for, but it has a lot to do with basically the vine's ability to uptake nutrients and its ability to hold its acidity, the ability of the grapes to hold their acidity for longer in uh, 
more basic soils that have a little bit more nutrient availability. Um, I kind of think of it as it's almost like a resilience thing. Like it gives them, they have a little bit more, a little bit more time to hold their acidity. So he, t- he talks about the fact that there's magnesium, that there's some clay on the top here. Mm-hmm. And then, it, then basically you hit the rock and that there's a higher, um, a higher amount of magnesium in the soil here. And that this produces for him, it's a, it's a more structured and, I always call it, it, it's definitely, he even, he even doesn't, doesn't like to, um, doesn't use any new wood on this because he feels like it's already got, you know, everything it needs without mm-hmm. it. And, and there's almost this, yeah. you know, tenacity to this wine and a structure to it that's almost like a red wine. Um, every time I taste it, it kind of is, it, it, I think that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's really cool about it is that so the vineyard itself, it's very shallow, it's very rocky, and it has these, you know, like I said, these kind of uh, big blocky kind of pieces of schist. There's a little bit of granite as well, and there's also mm-hmm. a little bit of clay on top. So it has a lot of pieces. Like you can kind of have the, you know, in Burgundy, we talk all the time about the whole limestone and clay thing, but you can kind of have this conversation in every every setting. You can talk about rocks and clay which is really kind of, you know, bones being the rocks, this kind of minerality, the structure, which you totally get in this wine. You really get that, you know, all of all of Thibaut's wines, actually, you really get a, a very distinct sense of kind of minerality and salinity. And then in this case as well, you also have this, you know, the clay gives it this um, balance, you know, a, a bit of softening up. You're exactly. I was going to say that's the <laughs> other thing about it. It's got the structure. But I think you've described mm-hmm. it, if, if I recall, as there's a baby fat to it at the same time. It's a structured wine, mm-hmm. but there is kind of a, and, and Sauvignon in general, Thibault always talks about it being, it, it's, it's easy to get that aspect to the wines. They can, you know, they, they can be generous. But I think the amazing thing about this is that it, 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 it that is all kind of, controlled in some way it's not it's not mm-hmm. it's not like a broad softness it's a really kind of straight yeah. they're, they're, it really I it's hard to describe I, it really is and i think i mean what's really cool about doing this tasting with tebow's wines is that he has such a he has such a, a gentle hand and i think we talked about this quite a bit while we were there like he has such a touch and it's very easy to, I think, lean really hard into whatever style the terroir is going to give you. You know, say we're talking about um, limestone versus schist soils. Like it's, I think because the wines lend themselves towards, the schist wines lend themselves towards kind of richness and blockiness and um, that kind of coarse, coarse salinity was how I first learned about it it's really easy to kind of, to do that and create beautiful, beautiful wines, but Thibaut almost makes them as though they're on limestone or he gives them this, this finesse that I think is really, really cool to compare because it, it kind of balances out those styles a bit. And I feel like even though it's so pretty and it's so finessed that you really do feel the actual terroir because there's a little bit less of a stylistic difference on the two from the winemaking side, I think. Well, he, he, no, completely. He's, he's very insistent and he loves to talk about it, that he, it, he doesn't make Chenin Blanc. He's, he wants the Chenin Blanc is this, and, and we've talked about this, that it is really the, the 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 way for the terroir to express itself and i think that's an amazing way to look at it and and he really doesn't want to talk about the grape except at, at how it translates the terroir in fact he goes so far as he's got all these mm-hmm. different clones that you know the, so that it's it's not uh, you know the clone it it's it's more about the 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 dirt, the rock, than anything else, and mm-hmm. and it's it's seamless. I'm I'm yeah. This is this is this is amazing. I want to now, if we can now maybe shift gears, and I want to taste the Colaute, which is, you know, historically, 
um, and, and kind of everybody there knows it, it was this for, forgotten sector of Savinier that, you know, going back, it's the area that people talked about as making the best wines in the area. And mm -hmm. um, so it was this, and the monks knew what they were doing, and this was the, the, the place that they had chosen. Um, there was an old abbey there, and he found in these books. And this, this site is completely different. I mean, you stand in mm -hmm. that vineyard, and you look at it, and, and you, you don't realize that you're standing on rock at the beginning. Tebow mm -hmm. likes to say that you look at it, it looks like it's sand and you don't realize that you're standing on rock. And he said, it's very much like the wine that there's a, a it's very deceptive. It seems like it's easy. And then all of a sudden you mm -hmm. realize there's this, 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 this big rock standing in front of you. And it's the same in the vineyard that, you know, the, the sheath comes to the surface. He says it takes four days for his team to clear out the, the, the rocks that have grown you know that term the the, the rocks yeah. come to the surface like every year i just think that's great that's a great analogy it's like it, they just keep that's where the walls keep getting taller and taller yeah they do it's so true yeah no i love this wine i think it's it's so beautiful i think i think we i remember when we were tasting in the cellar together and we kept trying to describe it's like kind of subtle power. And in my notes, I, I think it was you that said, I finally put, it was kind of strong, like a gymnast, you know, kind of in this, or, or, you know, like a kind of like a distance runner. Like it's not like a bodybuilder kind of strong. No. It's this, it's this really beautiful kind of like long, um, you know, like long lean muscle to it. That it's just totally, like, it's got, it's the funny thing about this wine is it is, and that's why I think he was talking about it in the way that it looks, you look, it looks like there's sand. It, it looks like a, a gentle place, mm -hmm. but at the same time, this is so, it's, it's so long. It's mm -hmm. super sneaky as far as a wine. And it's, there's also this mouthwatering salinity to it. The finish is yeah. incredibly saline. Um, yeah, and it's it's a to me it's it's a great contrast. I was excited to taste these two side by side because I think that the Vin Sandre it shows that clay and that broader side of Chenin mm -hmm. um, in a different way. There's also we didn't talk about it, but there's also that tiny reductiveness in the in the um, Vin Sandre. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely got this little Burgundian side to it. This is Chablis mm -hmm. in, in my mind. It's like really very straight. Um, and uh, yeah, I keep, I, I'm amazed every time I taste this wine. It's been, I think I was telling you that, that every time I taste the, the last three vintages, there's been such a progression. And he claims it's his farming and really the challenges they've had there. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a brilliant a brilliant wine really brilliant wine can you talk yeah, a little bit about the I, hard rock that this sits in and what that you know how you see that affecting the taste yeah i think so i mean i think that it uh you know more more to be discovered the more that we kind of continue tasting and looking at things but i i also think that these kind of really hard, I, I have some, they're not from the exact vineyard, but kind of these pieces of like hard schist has these, has these layers. This is actually from Sauvignon, but um, not the same vineyard. Um, this is like a very light colored schist that has the, it has these natural layers, which is really important. The term for that is schistosity. Like that's, that's why we call schist, schist or that's why we call schistosity. Anyways, um, it's a great word though, but that kind of like, is a cool one. And usually these these rocks have been tilted up on end because they've kind of gone through a lot of contorting. And um, uh, here's one of my favorite pieces. This is kind of like what's going on all over Sauvignon. Like wow. You can find these like crazy Beautiful. folded up bits. 
where there's harder things that are kind of resistant to it here. But then if you look close, it's kind of like that lighter stuff is like toothpaste. You wow. know, like it was that's just a... acting like mush. And that's what's happening all over Sauvignon. And so a lot of these layers have been kind of tilted up and the rock is really, really hard and it's going to break along those layers and it's going to start forming a little bit of soil, a little bit of clay, a little bit of, like I said, kind of baby fat on top of it. But really the rocks don't, they don't absorb a lot of water. They don't, they're providing some nutrients in situ. It's a harsh environment. It's, it's a dark, it's a dark colored rock that's going to be um, absorbing a lot of heat. It's not holding a lot of water to mitigate that heat. And it's, you know, it's really creating kind of a, a, a stressful place. And so in this case, you have this kind of light, soft, uh, gentle topography, gentle soil on top of it. But below it, you have this very serious, very kind of hard to, hard to adapt to situation underneath that soil. Um, and I think well, another he, comment- He, he talks about- a no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, another comment. No, no, no. Go so ahead. Important in terms of um, Shannon Blanc in particular and Loire Shannon is this conversation about salt that I attribute to um, that I learned about from my one of the first people to ever teach me about um, tasting wines was in an example of two Loire Shannons, Ted Vance, um, and he would talk about the coarseness of the salt in Shannon on Schist. And I think that that's a really, I come back to it all the time. And I think it's a really important context uh, context to think of it in. Because this, this wine is so, it has these straight lines that you kind of expect from like Schist or Slate, but they have this kind of grit and this coarseness to it. And that's kind of this like salty mouth watering sensation that I always get from Shannon. In almost almost a, a, a hint of bitterness to it, a positive mm -hmm. kind of, a, and, and, and I talk about that in the terms of texture. I mean, texture for me is, I mean, I think it's it's one of the, you know, it, it's it's one of the things that you have to have in great, great wine. And it's one of the things I love about Shannon because I do feel there's a, mm -hmm. I mean, it really is, there is kind of a red wine texture to it. Not red wine, but... I think people think of white wines as 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 not having that same type of texture, and I feel like mm -hmm. Shannon gives it gives it that. So, um, totally. In any event, so it's um, it's, it's and fun. And yes, to answer the question, that is Anjou Noir. So there are bits of Anjou that are on limestone, and whether the you know whether it's a wine or not, you would call it Anjou Blanc, whereas Anjou Noir are the they're the they're the black soils they're the schist old metamorphic versus the you know very young 150 to 90 million year old um, limestone soils to the east speaking of those soils maybe let's let's um let's let's jump to um to mont louis and uh we can jump back to Sauvignier um at, a, at another <laughs> moment um so un unfortunately, we've got a couple different wines here, but they're very similar. I've got the 17 um, Clohoche, um, which is right from Uso. So it's from this. It's literally it's it's uh, a half a, a half a kilometer or so from the um, the wine that you've got. You've got the 17. Les Autres so, um, both from uh, Jackie and Jean Philippe, mm -hmm. and th this is the highest um, part of Mont Louis, the coolest mm -hmm. sector. And um, and do you want to talk a little bit about this this kind of sector and where we are and the difference? Because it it is very different. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what's really cool about this? The, um, I mean, I guess kind of before we go straight into this vineyard, stepping back to the geologic setting, we have uh, these, again, kind of relatively flat lying 
layers of limestone. And as we move into the center of the Paris Basin, they're getting younger and younger. You can kind of think of them as, um, let's see, so we have two things here. Oh, it's hard to show, but it's kind of, it's, it's really, it's a basin, it's a bowl. So it's kind of like this. And so in the middle, you have this younger stuff that's filled it up and on the edges, you have the older bits. And as they've kind of been rounded off, sometimes you get the, the very top, especially in Vouvray, and Mont Louis, you get these, um, it's kind of what happened after the limestone deposition. So towards the end of the Mesozoic, those oceans that had been flooding the Paris Basin for so long kind of dried up and they emerged out of, the, out of, out of these shallow continental seas and became more terrestrial. And so the limestone started to stop forming and we start to get things like actual clay deposition. We get this kind of alluvial material, kind of conglomerates, uh, and we get more and more silex formation within the layers of limestone that are there. And so this vineyard in particular has a little bit of a, a non-limestone conglomerate cap to the top of it, and then there's limestone below it. And so you actually get, it's like really old alluvial material at the top of the vineyard and limestone below it. And, and I think and, that you sense that here, for sure. So, it, and it's, I mean, it's a completely, well, we, we, we are tasting 17, so we've got a different vintage, but still, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, to me, there's a completely different mouthfeel to the wines. There's a very different, um, mm -hmm. there's a different textural quality to it. Um, mm -hmm. There is a salinity, but it's a different kind of, salinity than we just tasted there's not the same tannic structure that we just had um it's a it's a little bit softer and rounder um it is what did what how do you so how did where where do we where do we take that is that in part because i mean here we do have below that that cap you've got a deep deep limestone bedrock i mean I can't mm -hmm. remember if it's 20 meters, 15 meters. I mean, it's a, it's a very deep limestone yeah. um, that, that there's, and Thibaut likes to talk about this, that there's, there's some water in there. There's the, you know, that limestone does nourish the vineyards differently. And I feel like that, I feel like that comes through and maybe some generous, the generous nature of this wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think this is such an interesting comparison to make because I think you have a lot of things going on and one is I don't I mean I don't know what the actual pHs of these final wines are but this does have a higher frequency to it to me it really does kind of just resonate a little more electrically while at the same time it does have this softness and this generosity to it on a higher frequency in a way that it doesn't feel like clay. It's not like clay gives you that like catty softness. Um, this is just kind of a smoothed stout feeling. And I think that that comes from the fact that you have limestone, lots of limestone that's actually quite calcareous, meaning, you know, calcareous can give calcareousness, can give kind of a, a harshness to a wine. Um, like the example would, the prime example would be like, you know, Barolo, where you have that really, really calcareous um, soil or champagne for that matter. Whereas this has a little bit more balance to it than being extremely calcareous, but it has the same texture of like champagne chalk, where it has a lot of porosity and permeability to it, meaning it can hold water and it can hold water in a way that's not wet or sticky it just holds it kind of like a sponge like it actually just soaks it all up and the vine doesn't have to sit with it you know like its feet aren't wet but it can pull, totally. yeah. pull out that water as it needs i think you have that and then you also have kind of this well, like the, little bits of alluvial stuff going on on top as well so you, you kind of have this fight between I think the limestone itself wants to be higher pitched 
higher frequency. But then there are all of these other things that are kind of giving it this, you know, softness and this, um, this more, more of a quiet feeling. Well, and, and I like your comment about high frequency because there is, uh, and, and this wine to me, again, has that little kind of almost a little bitter edge to it. That, that does give it a, a definition. There's a spice to this. Um, and I have to say, I'm tasting not exactly what you're tasting, the O'Shea, which there's always <laughs> this spice quality too. But I still think that there is that electricity. Um, but for whatever reason, this site also can give a little bit of some fat to it. Um, mm -hmm. My recollection of the Uso is it really is very straight. Um, it's a it's a little bit straighter than what I'm tasting, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, the the O'Shea, which which tends to be a little bit a tiny bit rounder. Um, mm -hmm. There's a little bit of Silex there on the top too, mixed in. Not as much mm -hmm. as you get in some places, but there is still some. But um, and these are harvested later too. These are the this is as cold as site. They're harvested almost. 10 days later than like the Clomiche or the Clomoni. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, uh, it's different. One thing that was very interesting, I was talking to Jackie recently and we were talking about global warming and, and he was describing how the fact that we harvest now so much earlier, you know, a month, a month and a half, you know, earlier, you have much less, room for error. If you harvest mm -hmm. in October, the days are much more forgiving. But if you're harvesting closer to, to August, the days, the difference between making a mistake between a day or a half a day can be mm -hmm. dramatic because the temperatures are so much the the spikes and the and the and the maturation process and I thought that was interesting. I didn't think about it in those terms, but it's it's Tebow talks about it. I mean, all the growers talk about it. The room for mm -hmm. error is getting smaller and smaller. Um, I don't know why why that made me think of it, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if and I don't I don't know this for a fact to clarify, but I also would imagine that Tebow would have it a bit harder than the growers on limestone because maybe just across the board, because it is you know, like schist is a little less forgiving in terms of the water it's going to hold and that natural ability to buffer what's going on. Obviously, that probably varies between site to site, but um, you're you're yeah. completely right. And he he talks about that. And he um, it, it's interesting. The other thing he mentioned to me was um, recently because I, I was talking about Burgundy and and he's like he's like in Burgundy, they go they, the wines go the Chardonnay goes through Mallow. And he goes, so if they're slightly, they can harvest grapes slightly just under ripe and, and it will round out in the barrel. He goes, if I harvest Chenin Blanc slightly under ripe, it's going to be green and it's not going to, I don't round it out because I don't, my wines don't go through mallow naturally. And uh, I thought that's, I mean, it's, it's kind of, you think about it, of course, but it's like, and, and it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting, an interesting uh, uh, factor. So let's yeah. cross you know, the river. One, Sorry, I'm go gonna, ahead. I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt for one second, because I think that's another really important point that I think is fascinating in talking about Loire winemaking is that the rocks are so different between this schist, this really, really hard schist, and this really, really soft, you can like dig away at it with your fingernails in some cases. But a big difference is that historically, the Tifo, you know, Anjou, if you want to use Anjou as an example, in the Anjou Blanc areas, you can, you can dig out cellars into you know, into the cliffs and you get cold cellars, you get cold fermentations. Historically, that's how it's always happened. You can't dig into schist in the same way. So there's, there is this historical precedent that's set with how the wines are made based on what the geology allowed them to do. And we're talking in a difference of so, 
you know, 100 meters, you can all of a sudden dig into a cliff versus not dig into a cliff. And I think that's so important for the history of how these two areas have, have made different wines for so long. No, it's a great point. Um, and it's and it's also allows them to do things and have done it for a long time naturally um, mm -hmm. without, you know, you don't need to stop a mallow with sulfur. You, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, there's a there, it, it's a whole series of natural advantages that right. are, ba you know, which other parts of France didn't have or other parts of the world didn't have. And it's it's um, yeah, very, very, very good point. So I'm dying to jump across the river to the Clovenese, which is Vouvray, you know, so I'd love you to talk about the fact that, you know, from Mont Louis, you know, you've got this, this drop into the Loire River, and then you go back up and, and, and we're, we're in this other, you know, very interesting place for Shannon. Yeah, interesting place for Shannon. And so, so like I mentioned, as we get into these slightly younger, I think I would have to double check this, but I think these are not quite as young as the, the alluvial stuff that happens at the top of Hussot. But as we start to get into the slightly young variations of this Tufo limestone, you have these interbedded layers of silex or um, in, in France and in this context when you have silex which is chert and when you have that occurring within limestone you <laughs> so they're really all the same thing but chert within limestone is flint and you have these um these what were little layers of it so layers of basically the same it's like the same little plankton critters that formed the chalky bits are the same things that form the CX, except instead of their skeletons being made of calcium carbonate, their skeletons were made of silica. And they kind of, so for some reason, there's like a bloom of plankton around that time with silica skeletons, and they kind of fell down to the, to the ocean floor. But because they were in a weird chemical environment, they dissolved into like a gel and they form, oh, I wish I had a piece of it, but anyways, they form, it's like glass, like a little layer of glass as it gets buried. Um, but as as that like gel formed and things kind of, you know, wobbled around, they formed these really beautiful little nodules. And so you get these kind of like rounded, hard blobs of silica. No, and, and, and there, I mean, hear. you've got a lot on the surface in this, mm -hmm. in this vineyard in particular. Um, mm -hmm. And they're and really hard. Just, so it's just really hard. So you have this kind of, you have this limestone mini, and now you're adding this component of really hard silica rock uh, minerality to it, I think. And and this wine to me is like this, it, it, it again, it reminds me a little bit stylistically of the Vin Sandre. You've got it, it to me is Burgundian again in some ways there's almost mm -hmm. a hint of reduction there's a beautiful textural quality to it it has a red wine structure um mm -hmm. and at the same time there's there's a generosity to it um it's a south facing clove um yeah. so which that i think does come through here but it's it's still it's got what you described earlier and i'm thinking about that as i taste these there is that electricity um the salinity is different in this it's it's a, it's a different uh, i'm trying to trying to compare it to the three previous wines it's different in a way do you have any yeah um the so the i was as i was taught which i over and over again agree with it's the salinity to especially this i think is it's finer grained you know, it's like, um, Ted would always say it's more like sea spray versus like coarse salt, like the, um, that's uh, a great like description. Salt. Yeah. No, it is. There's a, it's a, and, and it's less, um, I, I use the term bitterness earlier. It's less spicy. 
it's more like kind of a more delicate mm -hmm. pepper, pepper almost. I mean, I use the ter term white pepper sometimes to think about the mm -hmm. a spice that's in a in a a noble white wine, and this this has that um, quality to mm -hmm. it. Um, really, really interesting. Um, I kind of want to go back to the previous two wines before we move on quickly. We don't we're getting close on time um, or not close, but we're we we don't have a lot of time. So I, I have this idea that that um, that this wine I'm interested in tasting it against the Clos de la Ute for some reason, just to mm -hmm. there's. Mm -hmm. Because to me, there's some some similarity and um it's it's a, it's an energetic similarity somehow like it's a there's a seriousness to both of the these two ones the clodo loot and the um and the venice that it's that ten you know the it's the tension is in both of them and i think they're getting mm -hmm. there in different ways but they're both achieving tension that results in great wine they're, you know like i think that's what they're both they're both very long too mm -hmm. i mean the persistence yeah. is um wow it's very very interesting to taste that the, yeah. the cola you just has it, it does have this though there's some type of power dimension to it or some type of that's it's it's okay. it's different mm -hmm. it's 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 definitely got and I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, yeah, it, and I mean, I'm assuming that does come from that rock. There is some power that you uh, that you feel, whereas the Venice is, is just a little bit more. It isn't easy at all, but it's more kind of I feel like you can you can you can you can it's more accessible some way than the the Clodo Oud is like serious. It's like. I'm yeah. not fooling around. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, I I think that when the when the, you know, uh, for lack of a better term that actually includes Sauvignon, but like when the Anjou Noir wines, like when the Chenin on Schist wines are great, they are really exceptional in the way that they have this kind of like deeply resonating heart to them that I think mm -hmm. is just really moving. Like I, I am often, I think, uh, maybe I don't have enough like real tasting experience to say this, but I think that maybe if I were to be, you know, picking blindly, not knowing the producer, I would choose a Shannon on limestone because I'd be like, ooh, I know this is gonna be, you know, tasty, delicious, refreshing, um, but I think there are fewer examples, but when I am deeply moved by a Shannon on Schist, I buy it, you know, like there, there's some real heart well, to them. I, well, no, and I think that's a, there's, there's no question that, that Claude Laude, it makes you think it's like, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's not, it, it's not like just your. I, I don't know. There's there's really something compelling about it. I went back briefly to the Vin Sandre because I wanted to see how that compared um, to the other, and then we'll we'll taste some more Mont Louis, and we've got one. So wow. I'm really curious. So there's definitely. If, if you don't mind, if I if I can just go ahead you for a second, but I'm really I would like to use this opportunity to sort of ask you your thoughts and opinions about why Shannon is such a good arbiter of terroir. You know why it's you know why Shannon for for you to do two two weeks. Too intensive. Leave your life on Shellac. You know why? <laughs> well, I mean, 
I've got to be careful because I, 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 I have a lot of friends in Burgundy and elsewhere. So it's, it's not, uh, you know, no, I think it's, uh, first off, um, I think it, it, people don't realize enough about how great, it, a great a grape it is, how interesting a grape it is. And so discovery is a lot of what we do and what I like to do. It's like, you know, so everybody knows that there's great Chardonnay and Burgundy and, and there's, you know, that's not a that's not a big surprise. But I don't think and and thankfully the last 10 years, there's been an amazing resurge or, or and it is resurgence because Shannon was historically an important grape. Um, and so it, it was, you know, and, and then you have people like Thibaut who, you know, and, and, and Jackie and Jean-Philippe and. And there's a million of great grower, a million, maybe not a million, but there's a lot of really extraordinary people. Um, Andrea Molyneux, who we talked to from South Africa on on Tuesday, you know, that are really doing some exciting things with a grape that goes back a long way historically. It's transparent. There's a transparency to it, and it does reflect the place kind of in a in a really remarkable way. Chardonnay, it does reflect place, but I think it's it's a little tougher sometimes to get at the dirt and the rocks. And I think that Shenan is is easier to get at the 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 terroir. And I think this this you know just short tasting has has kind of you know reminds me every time I do it that there is such a difference, particularly in the farming that these people do, which is serious and the transparent way that they make the wines. And you mentioned the historical cellars, the, the cool cellars. And I think all of that, that's why it's a, it's a great grape. It's also reasonably priced. I mean, I can't afford a Grand Cru Burgundy every night. And these wines in the context of the great white wines of the world are reasonable. Anybody can can kind of dive in and mm -hmm. and try them. They age well. The also, frankly, food wise, I mean, the acidity, the 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 ability to go with food is unparalleled in some ways. So, yeah. I don't know if that was the question you asked, but it's yeah, it is. It, it is definitely. <laughs> I yeah, I I definitely agree. There's a very special and same. My home, my home and my heart is in Burgundy, but uh, there's, I, there's a very special place for Same Chenin. Blanc. Yeah. I almost snuck in a, yeah, and a Jamie Motley Shannon as well. She's doing cool stuff with, I have one in my no, fridge. There's, but. but you know what? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a great history. Andrea and I talked about that on Tuesday. You know, there's twice as much Chenin Blanc in South Africa going back to the 1600s. California has an amazing history and its mm -hmm. resurgence, which is amazing and and great. I mean, that's so, so fun. So I just said we have two more wines to taste and we've got three and a half minutes or so. So oh, with so the, we'll do with it. The, <laughs> no, so we've got Xavier Weisskopf, who's also in Mont Louis. Um, the first one is the is the Touche Mitain. Um, this is a really cool site, um, and this is again you've got some Silex on the topsoil. You've got as you as you described, there is some alluvial um, before okay. you, and there's more of it before you hit. There's there's more of it before you hit that deep limestone. This is kind of in the more the south southern part towards San Martin, the, the you know the 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 it's a different sector of Mont Louis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is kind of like my test because I don't know too about these wines. We didn't go there together, but mm -hmm. so it's kind of like the this is like truly blind for me, which is fun to kind of. There you go. The so tell me the, the test. There, <laughs> there we go. We'll put you on. We'll put you on the spot. No, I think this is a. A, a, a wine that um, it, it, it to me in some ways it doesn't have the broadness that we talked about. It's a little more linear. Um, mm -hmm. It's 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 a cool site. Um, it's you know yeah. in fact the 
the name of the vineyard is for, you know, the, the people put mittens on in there typically to work it because it oh. really is a cool spot. And to me, it's a colder wine in some ways. I think it comes across as that. Um, and uh, even in 18, which is a ripe vintage, you've got some roundness, but I think you still have that lean quality to it. Um, yeah, there's kind of a freshness that I didn't get in the other wines. The other wines were refreshing, but this has that kind of like cool splash of water. That's a great description for this. Totally. And then literally we're racing to the finish here, but we, the last wine is, is interesting. And I wanted to do it because it's, it's the bordery. It's a single site and it's a, it's a demi sec. It's a wine that, um, this is the 15 vintage. Um, it's actually the first wine he harvest every vintage. And I mean, this is the history of the Loire Shannon too, is wines with a little bit of residual sugar naturally. Um, and I think the amazing thing about this wine, it's a great food wine because you've mm -hmm. got that, that kind of, I, I don't even think the sweetness comes through immediately. If you don't tell someone there's 15 grams approximately. Um, and it's why Shannon's magical because that balance between the acidity and the sugar, um, I mean, and 15 was a ripe vintage too. So it's, you've got Perouche. This is yeah. what Xavier was talking about. There's a lot of those on the top. Um, and he tried to make a dry wine. I know you've talked about this in the past. And he said, this vineyard does not make a dry wine. This is the wine that the vineyard wants to make. I tried it early on. And basically now he, he's, he lets the vineyard do it and it's it's literally it for us it's one of the most versatile food wines that we have with with our clients it's it's um and it's to me it's why shannon also is interesting because you can have all these different expressions from you know dry to sweet to literally bot you know botrytis and yeah. it can be amazing sparkling Brenna, well, i've acidity, got 40 acidity. 48 seconds so i'm gonna i'm gonna say it's been a pleasure to see you long distance across the across yeah, the so across the country you. look forward to coming out yeah. and seeing you soon or you you being in new york thank you so much thank you so much david